From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. So our speaker today is back for his second tour of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. He spoke earlier about losing the yacht painkiller in the Western Caribbean, but he's got nine lives. We're going to welcome today a member of 26 or so years who stopped being a member when he started cruising a lot, who has many, many harrowing tales of his life as a U.S. customs agent and undercover drug smuggler on behalf of the U.S. government. Ron Landeman, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. So you worked in the Customs Service. Give me a day in the life of a customs agent. What would you do in a typical day? Well, that's the beautiful thing. There was no typical day. You have to remember that customs deals in inanimate objects. It deals in cargoes. Immigration deals in people. We dealt with cargoes. We dealt with stuff. So my expertise was in drug smuggling. And um, because of my background um, with boats and things, I was tasked with infiltrating cartels. And by the way, all undercover agents are volunteers. Uh, contrary to what you see in television movies, no one gets assigned to work undercover. They are asked if they want the assignment, if they want to do it. So they're a paid customs agent, and then they could be asked if they want to volunteer for the hypothetically much more dangerous role of being an undercover agent. Is that, I got this right now? Yes, yes. Well, okay. tell me if you think it's dangerous to go to Panama City and meet with members of the Medellin cartel. <laughs> so essentially, that's what you, that's what a customs agent who's undercover. That's what I did. That's what you did, exactly. That's what I did. While you were undercover as a customs agent, give me a scenario. You walk into this room, you get, there's a meeting that's well, been... Well, no, there has to be an, an entry point in uh, cocaine business. Yeah. You have the production, you have the manufacturing of cocaine, then you have the transportation of it, you have the sale of it, and then you have money laundering. So somewhere in that circle you need to get inserted. Well, we're not going to grow the stuff. We're not going to manufacture it. By we, you mean we, a U.S. customs agent? U US, U.S. government. Yeah. But we, we could launder the money or we could um, do the transportation. Cocaine has no value in, in South America. But if you put it in an airplane and it flies to North America, all of a sudden that $500 kilo of cocaine is worth 22, 28,000, whatever it is now, uh, kind of lost that. But we dealt in uh, large cargo. So, um, large, how big is large? Eight tons. I don't know. Eight tons of Coke. What's the value of eight tons of Coke in America? Well, when I was doing it, 22,000 a key, um, figure yeah, 40 million. Yeah. 40 million bucks. That's like 12 feet by 12 feet by 12 feet, or what is that? 20 by 20 by 20? Not even that big. No, it, it would fit in us easily in a small container. A shipping container. It probably, it'd probably fit in a 10-foot U-Haul truck. Okay. A good story is um, an agent asked me, he said, I'm working on a hashish smuggling organization. They had a sailboat that they've used on several occasions to bring in uh, hashish into Canada and the United States. Would you be interested in finding out if the boat is for sale and, and possibly meeting the captain. And I said, yes. I said, what are we talking about? He says, well, we got to fly to Miami and meet the boat broker. Special agent and I flew to Miami, made an appointment to uh, meet the boat broker. And I told him what I was looking for. And he says, you know, I have one, but it's, um, it's at anchor in the Gulf of Mexico. And I said, well, you know, I'm looking for certain things. I'm looking for cargo area inside the boat. And he says, well, this boat should do perfectly. <laughs> and I said, well, I'd like to meet the owner or the captain and talk to them directly. And he says, well, I'd like to set that up. I gave him some numbers and way to contact me back in San Francisco. And back then we had pagers and I, my pager went off and I dialed the number and I talked to a gentleman in Taos, New Mexico. Taos being the sailing capital of New Mexico. <laughs> 7,000 feet or whatever it is. 
And he said he heard that I was interested in his boat and uh, he suggested I fly to Albuquerque and meet him. And I contacted our Albuquerque office, told him what I needed, and um, they rented a couple of hotel rooms near the airport in Albuquerque. They wired up my room with audio and video, and they rigged the door between the two rooms to be a breakaway door. Wait, wait a breakaway door means what? Meaning if they heard screaming or anything, they could bust into my room and save me. They're, they're what we call a cover team. I arrived, called the captain, and he, he came up to my room. He, he wanted to talk about boat plumbing, boat electronics, navigation. He was really fascinated about macerators. What size of boat? Give us a little. This boat, I think, was around 85 feet. What's the price tag? So, 350000 Okay. It's an 85-foot powerboat. Sailboat. Oh, an 85-foot sailboat. A y'all, sloop, catch, what? I believe it was a catch. Okay. Uh, I have to look it up now. He was testing me to see if I was really a boat captain or, or a cop. Yeah. And um, eventually he said, you know, I think we're in the same business. I asked him what business that was. And he says, we haul specialized cargoes. <laughs> so he said, um, are you interested in my boat? I said, yes, I'd like to see it. And I said, what's the price tag? And I already knew from the broker it was 350 He said, do you have the cash? He said, I want cash. I said, yes. It's in San Francisco. Can you come on up and see it? So we set a time, and this was near. Wait, wait, now, which is in San Francisco, the boat or the cash? The cash. The cash is in San Francisco. So you're inviting him to come up here to see the bucks so you can give him the money, and then he would give you custody of the boat in Florida or wherever it is. No, he would, he would just see if, that I was the real deal, that I had the money. Okay. What would he see that would cause him to, to see that? What in San Francisco would you be showing him? You're not going to show him a stock of 20s. What would you show him? Oh, no. We we do it a little differently than that. The special agent in charge of my office, I, I wrote a letter and he signed it and I took it to the uh, Federal Reserve Bank and I checked out $350,000. In $100 bills or in what? Yeah, hundreds. Yeah. A friend of ours who was a banker gave me a safe deposit box that was almost three square feet, three by three by three. And I put the money in the safe deposit box. My friend showed up from Taos. I took him to the bank. We signed in, opened up the safe deposit box, and he got to play with the money. But he couldn't take anything, and it was quite safe because we were in a bank. And so essentially, this is mar- my guessing this is marked money some way that it could be identified later? Not at this point? It's no, not- it, was your, it was your tax dollars at work. <laughs> okay. So after he saw the money, he said, you know, I have any. And I said, well, I'm going to take you to a restaurant on Lombard. And I, I took him to Scott's Seafood House. And I have a surveillance team on me. And they're following uh, you wherever you go, the surveillance team? Yeah. We go to Scott's and we're seated. This time I was also a group supervisor. A female agent and a male agent, young, from my group, were seated a across the aisle from us, just by happenstance. You mean completely coincidentally? Coincidental, but they're watching us. Yeah, so, but they know what you're doing. They know what you're up to. They, they know what's happening. Well, they're there to protect me. Yeah, okay, got it. Okay. Well armed. So, uh, <laughs> and you're at what age, what age are you in this point? You in your 40s, 30s, what? Yeah, I was probably in my 40s, yeah. Okay. And, and they're in their late 20s. So uh, the bad guy says, look at this guy working on her. I don't know if he's going to get laid or not. And I'm, I'm looking over and going, oh, my gosh. It was pretty funny. So um, we finished dinner, and he says, you know, there's a famous place in San Francisco for Irish coffee. I said, yes. He said, I'd like to go there. Wait, wait, you're talking about the Buena Vista Cafe? We are talking about the Buena Vista. So we uh, jump in my undercover car, the surveillance team in tow. We go to the Buena Vista Wait a second, their surveillance team, to, not the same man and woman, because he'd recognize them. Different- no, they're they're, they had to stay outside, but there's like 10, 10 agents on me. So uh, <laughs> Buena Vista, it's probably 10 o'clock at night. The place is packed. Looking around, looking around, I thought, oh, great. There's no. And there I see an elderly gentleman, 60s probably, with three gorgeous young ladies and two empty seats at a big round table. Frank Kowalkowski? (laughs) (laughs) 
So I go over and I said, hey, uh, could we join you if I buy a round? Certainly. So the two of us sit down, round of Irish come. And I said, excuse me, sir, but <clears throat> you got to tell me what's going on here. <laughs> he says, these are my three daughters. They just came up from San Diego State for Christmas and they wanted an Irish. I said, ladies, this is the biggest BS story I've heard. <laughs> Show me your driver's licenses. <laughs> so they all pull out their driver's license. And I said, my God, you are sisters. I said, we need another round because dad's paying for three of you to be in college at the same time. And dad's going, yeah. So <laughs> another round and another round. I resemble that remark, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and those are your tax dollars at work too. Me, me buy them. The bad guy's name is Aldo. And he says, um, I've decided to stay through New Year's in Berkeley. And Jane and I lived in uh, Oakland on the water. And I go, oh my, oh great, you're not flying home. What's, wait, what's, what's that mean, oh my, okay, is that good or bad? This is bad, because I wanted him to fly back to Taos, right. because he's a little too close to where I live. Oh, so, so he's in Berkeley. Down long, because he might somehow discover that you're not the potential drug smuggling partner he needs. The way coincidence works, I could have run into him at Whole Foods or something, you know? Right. So uh, I took him to Bart and dropped him off and went home. And uh, <laughs> New Year's comes. Time for Jane and I to go to the New Year's celebration at St. Francis, except for I'm working on a major organization with some real bad guys. So as I'm putting on my tux, I put on my shoulder holster. And we go and we have a wonderful time at St. Francis. Now, St. Francis and other places, they have their rules about what you can bring in and what you can't. It doesn't so wait a second. So you, you were packing because in case this bad guy was on to you and at any given moment, decided to try to hurt you, ambush you or something, you need to be prepared to protect yourself. Is that what I'm hearing from you? That's exactly it. So wherever you'd go, this is, was this just because you were going to the city again or just because you're going to have a tux on or were you always sort of ready to prepare, prepared to protect yourself? We we're, were always armed 24 seven. So you're always packing. Someone. Always. The difference is you're going to St. Franny now and we might have rules about, we don't have metal detectors, but there's other rules. Yep. Like I said, St. Francis had its rules. We had ours. So, uh, yeah, have you seen it in the James Bond movies where uh, the guy in the tuxedo is dancing with his, yeah, that was me. So, uh, <laughs> but far better looking than that. Uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> John Connery? Yeah. So uh, uh, he was the best. So um, Agreed. we wanted to go uh, down to Baja near... Um, San Jose del Cabo to look at the boat, but we couldn't get any flights. So he invited me to um, Taos to meet some friends and to discuss things. Wow. So this is scary because if you're, if he knows who you are, now you're going to be in Taos. He's no longer in your backyard. He might be in his backyard where his own criminal people could off you or something. Well, the, the other read is he has talked to his organization and they have more hash hash available in Southeast Asia and that they can move on their new boat called the Malakula. Which you're about to buy, in other words. No, that, uh, I was about to buy their old boat. Okay. So he invited me up to Taos and we called the local office in um, Albuquerque. And I said, hey, I'm going to be staying at his house. And they said, well, we'll send an agent up. And uh, the agent's job was to uh, read the newspaper to see if any dead bodies showed up. And uh, I went out to all those houses. Wait, 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 wait. First of all, you're going to Taos, New Mexico, because the drug smuggling party wants to meet you down there and wants you to meet some of his other buddies so that you're basically being checked out. Is that what's going on there? No, he um, he wants to broach the subject about me taking their old boat, the one in Mexico, across the Pacific to pick up more hash heesh. Oh, take it over there. Do a, Go get a pickup. Go pick yeah, so up. They, so they'd have we'd have two boats going at the same time, which I, I, which I was in favor of. So he wants to meet he wants you to meet these other drug smugglers in Taos, and they're checking you out to see is this the guy we want to trust with our twenty million bucks worth of hash or whatever it is. Yeah. Is that what's going on? Okay. So, so 
how, you, so you're going to tell us, I don't understand what you said about the newspaper now. What does that mean? Well, there, there's no way I could call the surveillance agent who was assigned to watch out for me. So the only thing he'd be looking for is reports of dead bodies. If the bad guy found out who I was and killed me, yeah, left me someplace, the agent who was assigned to go to Taos, he would be looking in the newspaper and talking to the police. Okay. Hey, anything un unusual. To recover. So, wait, so when you go to Taos, you tell them what plane you're taking, and your undercover guys are all over the place, aren't they? Walking in Taos, there was one. Yeah, Taos. So when I left Albuquerque, I was going through Santa Fe. I said, you know what? I don't have any good pictures of him. So I, I went to a Walgreens or something, and I bought a point-and-shoot camera and uh, took it on up with me. Anyway, I get to his house, and he puts me in the downstairs bedroom, two locked army duffel bags. And uh, he says, yeah, I'm getting ready to go overseas. <clears throat> Something we haven't talked about, Ron, is um, I was a trained lock pick. So I picked the locks on the duffel bag and looked in charts and two meter radios and this and that, and the other thing, and locked everything back up. Uh, we went out that night and met his friends and we stayed out from about seven until three in the morning. When we left the bars, they, it was snowing. He woke me up at seven and said, let's go flying. So I have flown with a lot of customs pilots who most of them have two, three, 4,000 hours of flying. He had just gotten his, gotten his license with the 50 hours. We went to the airport, the, the runway was dry and the airport in Taos is long and wide. And he had a Cessna 150, one of the most powerful aircraft on the planet earth. Describe it for our viewers. How, how, two engines? What it's is the it? smallest thing you can get. I think it has a lawnmower engine in it. <laughs> anyway. Is one tried, engine or two engines? Single engine. Single engine goes 120 or something? <laughs> Downhill. Okay. <laughs> so it goes, goes, yeah, 110, one of those. Okay. Single so we, engine. Okay. We, we prep it, take off, and it's dead calm, and we're flying over, I think it's the Colorado River canyon and there's snow in the trees and it's gorgeous and i am gagging because um i've had too much alcohol and it's only a couple of hours since i went to bed and i didn't get enough sleep right so we're coming in for a landing and again the runway is extremely wide it has tricycle gear three wheels down all the time and as we're coming down to land we're drifting off to the left even though there's no wind and i said oh my god i'm gonna die because i'm an idiot i'm I'm flying with somebody with 50 hours. So uh, we landed, tied the plane down. I said, uh, let me take some pictures of the proud new pilot with his plane. Oh, got it. Right. I took a bunch of pictures. Next day I went home. That's a pretty dangerous moment because, because you know, he's got to be thinking, somebody's taking a picture of me. That they uh, he, yeah, he was actually quite proud. So uh, he says, hey, the organization will not bring in a new person. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. and. Uh, he said, I, I can't go through with the sale of the other boat until I come back from this deal. And I said, that, that's fine. <clears throat> and um, I went back to San Francisco and he flew to the Philippines where we had people track him. He picked up the new boat um, in, in actually in Australia, sailed it somewhere off the Philippines and it was loaded. We followed his track across the Pacific. And um, when he was getting to the Gulf of Alaska, uh, the case agent, me, and a couple of other agents flew up to Seattle, where we boarded the Coast Guard cutter at Kushnet, a 212-foot Coast Guard cutter that's no longer in service and so old. And we took off, and uh, the game plan was that when we approached the sailing vessel loaded with hashish, I would talk to the bad guy on the radio, and he would surrender because he'd known me for 18 months now in, in various scenarios. You wanted him to surrender so that there wouldn't be a scuffle. Somebody could get hurt, him or your agents, etc. Better for him to voluntarily surrender. Yeah, that's exactly it. So we came up behind him five miles away, and uh, we got into the Coast Guard rib, which is a great big rigid bottom inflatable. You got into the rib? That's scary. Okay. And two customs agents, two DEA agents, an Oregon State police officer, and... Um, a Coast Guard officer and a Coast Guard um, coxswain driving the boat. And we took off, total darkness. And when we approached, I got on the handheld radio and said, Olaf, 
You know me as Ron Wells. I'm actually Ron Landman. I'm a special agent with the Customs Service. He says, I don't know you. If you get any closer, I'm going to shoot. And we could see people scurrying on deck. How big a boat is he on? He's on an 87-foot yawl. Why would you approach from a rib rather than the big, safe, protective 200-foot Coast Guard boat? Because you can't sneak up on a 212-foot Coast Guard vessel. Too okay. noisy. Too noisy. But you could pursue him. He's on a yawl. That can't go very fast. Right. And we could, well, these, these ribs do 40 knots. So. Of course, of course, of course. But but you also can be shot at if you're in the rib and he had automatic, you know, rifle. Well, there is that. Yeah, yeah. We 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 had submachine guns and shotguns and handguns and all kinds of stuff. So anyway, I talked to him again and we could see people scurrying. At the same time, the captain of the, the Kushnet recalled us, said, come back, come back to the ship. He didn't believe it was safe. So as I don't believe it's safe either. <laughs> I don't know anything. <laughs> you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. So um, I don't do anything halfway. So uh, we're just turning around and all of a sudden, boom, there's an explosion. Flames going up 30, 40 feet. The sails catching on fire. And now everything's backlit. We can see people jumping in the, in the water. So we turn back around. The main explosion goes out. There's a... There's, Things are on fire, but it's not as bright as it was. It's, it's still dark out. The coxswain maneuvers the boat over, and we can hear people going, help me, help me. And we motor over to them, and I'm thinking, you blew it up. Seattle's 400 miles start swimming, but Coast Guard's job is to rescue people. So it's totally dark around us. I get out a handcuff. There's somebody over the side next to me. I grab a hand, slap a handcuff on it feel something come off in my hand, drop the handcuff, reach over, grab him by the seat of the pants and just lifted him up and threw him in the bottom of our boat. <clears throat> a, a big adrenal rush. We couldn't see anybody else in the boat, even though now there's like 13 of us. We asked him how many people were on board. They wouldn't tell us, but we did a head count and we counted six of them. You mean you rescued six people? Yes. So by now the Akushnet is moving towards the fire but what they can't tell is that when they when it blew up, the helm turned slightly to starboard and it was making a one mile circle. But military helmsmen sail a perfectly straight course. So they they didn't know that they didn't realize they were cutting on the inside of it, but they were and they were going straight and the Akushnet was turning. Now they've got the fire monitors out and they're shoving water on it. And now these 18, 19, 20 year old coasties have flames up close and personal, and they're trying to put out the fire. Meanwhile, we're chasing both the Malakula. So the yacht smashes into the port side, if I got this right, of the 200-foot Coast Guard boat. And now because it's been on fire, flames are coming up the side of the metal ship, but they're still safe on the, on the Coast Guard ship, right? Yes, but now we've got fiberglass burning, We've got hashish burning. We have sails burning. We have lines burning. People in the water. Yeah. But we don't see, you know, we can't tell what's going on. We can see the water uh, going on the ship. But finally, they allow us to board. The or Akushnet. you get on the yacht. Which do you get on? Oh, no. The the, the Malakula, the yacht, is totally on fire. Right. Stand to stern. Okay. And she's... So, She's under power. She's moving with it, with her engine still going, and the, yes. and the helm turned yes. slightly to starboard. So mm -hmm. it's making these big clockwise uh, one mile circle. One mile circles. I guess, and it's still moving, and it's on fire. Yep. Okay. So we get permission to board. We go over. There's a Jacob's ladder. Yep. We get the bad guys up on deck where we have more customs agents. More. I did get a bad guy with handcuffs up at Jacob's ladder. You know, I don't recall him. We were so pumped up, we probably threw them up there. <laughs> yeah. um, it's amazing. What it you, the, for, for, to describe a Jacob's Ladder for the few viewers who are, haven't gone up one. Yeah, Not you don't have one on uh, Youngster. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a rope ladder with wood <laughs> rings going across. And, um, th um, they're usually rolled up on deck. And when they push them over the side, they're tied down on the on the vessel. When they they're rolled over the side and they roll down and they end right at the water level. And uh, they're kind of fun to climb because they're moving as as you're moving. 
<laughs> so anyway, we get everybody on deck. We get them down on their knees. By this time, we have them unhandcuffed, hands on their heads, and they're searched. Is your guy, is the guy who was part of this that he, you were undercover with, he's, in, he's among the six that you rescue? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Where are the other people that were on the boat before on the criminal boat, the y'all? Um, they're on deck. Um, one of them, his, his hair has melted like a yarmulke. One guy has his eyebrows gone. Um, all facial hair is gone. Side hair is gone. Um, the corpsman on the ship, on the Coast Guard vessel, had to call some medical facility to get advice on how to deal with burn victims. Wow. Um, we, we put them all in a void on the ship under uh, guard. A void uh, meaning like a small chamber? What's a void? A chamber with no equipment in it. Okay. At the a same storage time, compartment. Okay. At, at the same time, a uh, <clears throat> Coast Guard officer or crew member and the customs agent who started this whole investigation, they jumped um, on the back of the burning vessel and they got out, I think it was 1,600 pounds of hashish. And um, Why do they want to get the hashish off the burning yacht? Well, the bad guys thought that if there were, if there were no drugs recovered, we would not have a, a criminal case. Evidence. So they set the fire themselves? Their plan was to get a gas can from on deck, take it to the engine room, pour the gas in the gas can, take rags, soak them, soak the rags in the gas, and put them in a, on an exhaust header in the engine room. The problem was the engine room was... Sometime later, like a time bomb would go off? Is that the idea? Yeah, the problem was the engine room was 140 degrees and uh, there were generators and alternators working with sparks. <laughs> because of the high heat, right. the, the gas went to fumes Fume, right. almost Fume. immediately. And two of them were in the engine room when the explosion went off and it was the flames going over their heads that burned them. They were, they were so uh, lucky to be alive. And they were highly motivated to jump in the uh, Gulf of Alaska. Good heavens. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. What nationality and languages were spoken by the criminal? Uh, Dutch. I think a couple of Americans. I think maybe a couple of Hispanics. So I don't what remember. Age, what uh, age were these guys? Give us the form factors. Uh, they were probably from low 20s to um, the bad guy I was working with. His uncle was on board. He was probably in his 50s. He was uh, from the Netherlands. So we headed back to uh, San Francisco. The so the Coast Guard boat with the criminals aboard, confined in a jail-like setting, comes back to San Francisco. What about the other people who had been on the burning yacht, the drug smuggling yacht? Where'd they go? Oh, they were all with us. So there were only six of them. Okay, so there weren't there weren't more than six on the bo boat when it caught on fire. No. So nobody was overboard. Okay, they all got they, rescued. They had they had 16, 16 tons of hashish on board. They had very little room for maneuvering, walking around. You know, how, how much is the, what's their street value of sixteen tons in America of hashish? Thirty million. Okay, and so these are not king. What level of kingpin or non kingpin criminals are these? Well. See, now we've just done a seizure and an arrest, and now the real investigation starts about all the people that we don't know who are in the organization. The people giving the captain the orders to um, go and um, the people financing it. So the, the case agent, the one who originally asked me if I wanted to go to Miami and talk to this boat broker, he did the follow-up investigation and I'm not sure how many people he indicted, um, but um, it was probably 20 or 25 people. The person I was up against undercover, he pled uh, 30 to life. So in other words, after pleading, his his sentence was 30 to life. So they had him on a bigger charge than that, apparently, is what you're saying. No, no. It, it, uh, smuggling that much hashish is a, a huge crime. Life sentence kind of thing, you mean? So after pleading, I don't understand. I'm, I'm not a criminal. Well, instead of going to trial, yeah. let, let me tell you this. Every criminal that I was undercover against or with, yeah. however you yeah. want to look at it, yeah. none of them went to trial. 
we had too many audio recordings. We had too many video recordings. We had too many reports of investigation that I wrote with all of the activity. We had too many surveillance. Everybody pled. Meaning didn't go to trial, meaning you could have won a case so solidly that they wouldn't want to go up before a jury. They'd want to plead a case. That's they'd, it. Never, they'd want to bargain. Uh, let's not go to trial. I'll confess to some lesser version of my criminality for which I would go. When you say 30 to life, that's what he got after pleading or that's what he would have gotten before he pled? That's after he pled. And under the federal system, he had to do 85% of that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So and that guy, that guy spent 27 years in the slammer. If he isn't still there now, okay. he's out. He's out. Yeah. And actually, uh, I know where he lives. But uh, if if you're really interested, ask Judge Graham, Steve Graham, when uh, we, when we were children, my wife, me, Steve Graham, he was an assistant United States attorney in San Francisco, and he worked these drug cases. He would have been a prosecutor of drug cases like this. Wow, so this is amazing. So so all those six people that went to the slammer, they didn't burn, they didn't drown, they got picked up on your raft. Their plan was to get a fire ready to go with a time bomb, get off the yacht, and then while they're gone, the heat of the engine room and their half-assed plan would set off the fire and burn the yacht in evidence while they escaped the yacht. That was their criminal's plan before it went sideways. Tell us about these people who are the criminals that you ran into as a U.S. customs agent undercover uh, working the drug wars. Are these people, uh, what's their education, average level? How many years have they typically been criminals? Give us a profile. Some of them are very well educated. Uh, Stanford MBAs. Um, if they put the same amount of effort into a legitimate business, they would be Fortune 500 CEOs. They they think they're doing less work running a smuggling organization than they would in a legitimate business, but they're really not. Um, the risks and rewards are really up there, but um, when we catch them, I mean, do you want to go away for 27 years? I don't think so. Give me kind of a profile of these guys. They're like 36, 50% of them are college educated. Many are college educated, uh, uh, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, um, some in finance. Um, Have they had failed careers? That's why they resorted to crime? What's the what's the typical? You know, some of them get into it because they, uh, um, they used to like to go to the fern bars and uh, snort a little coke and uh, pick up. Uh, women in San Francisco, and they found out a way to pay for their habit. And then they found out they could make a lot of money. And then they made the contacts overseas with the producers of the hashish or the marijuana or the cocaine. And uh, uh, they got into the life. And some of it's kind of romantic. You know, they, some of them uh, know famous people, you know, movie stars and things, and they get they, they think that's important. And uh, like I said, it, if they went into legitimate business, they would be major successes. And if you and I were to uh, take them to lunch in the grill room, we'd have a lot of fun because they're many of them are very nice people. So now during this 25 year career in the customs service, part of which you spent as an undercover agent, what's the case load like typically in a year? How many cases would you have ongoing? During this case that I just described, I was also doing a, a cocaine deal in uh, Panama. I was a owner of a smuggling aircraft uh, <laughs> at the same time with a different persona. Um, and at the same time, I had a third case I was working on and uh, using three different undercover personas. Now your undercover persona, <clears throat> Ron, is developed over time. And that includes background, that includes credit cards, passports, library cards, driver licenses, and all that stuff. So how are you working three at once? Is this just efficiency? They want to basically utilize the 40-hour-a-week world okay. of you? Or, or... No, no, I, oh, we never worked a 40-hour-a-week. We worked so, a minimum of 50 many times, much more than that. No, um, you again, it's all voluntary. These cases come up, and... Uh, I was very good at what I did, and I, I volunteered. 
The heart. So you got, so you got case number one going, but don't you have to worry about all of a sudden you're in a restaurant and the guy says, "Hey, Bill," and then the other criminal says, "Wait, his name was supposed to be Carl." How's that? How do you worry about the overlap? Well, here's a big secret. In undercover work, you always use your real first name so that if you're all the way across the starting line room, I yell, Ron, you better turn your head. Got it. Because you can't act, you can't say Bruce. And if I yell Bruce and you, you're not turning around, we've got a problem. Right, right, right. So you always use your first name and you'll have multiple cases going at the same time. And, and you got different cell phones or the same cell phones. How do you handle that part? All kinds of things. Yeah, you All kinds of things. Okay, don't say more. I don't want to endanger you or anybody else. Um, wow. So what's the typical tenure of an undercover agent? How long do they do this kind of a game? <clears throat> Special agents can retire at age 50, and they have to retire by age 57. I promise that if I survived when I turned 50, I would retire. Promise turn, your wife, you mean? My family, yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Um, I turned 50 in July of 1999, and I waited until the last day, December 31st, 1999. That's when I retired. So 50 and change for me. So what do you miss about the life of being an undercover agent for the U.S. Customs Service? Well, <laughs> uh, what don't you like? The, the travel, the intrigue, the interesting people that think they are so smart. Uh, <laughs> in arresting and indicting lawyers, they were one of my favorites because they always felt they were so smart. <laughs> um, it, it's really about protecting the public too, again, you know, from themselves. It, Robin Williams used to talk about surplus money. When you have more money than you need for lodging, food, and clothing, what do you do with it? His case, he used a lot of drugs, and many others do that. So, um, you know, keeping drugs off the shore of the United States was very important to me. I've seen um, uh, many, many people die way, way too young for the wrong reasons. Um, very upsetting. So there's a big fentanyl crisis that we've all been reading about for the last couple of years in America. Is that uh, coming from offshore? Is that coming from domestic manufacturing, the fentanyl? Mainly China, yeah. Mainly China. It's coming in from China. Yeah, our friends, okay. yeah, our friends in China. Okay. Now, you, uh, you're, how often are agents, how often are they married to an agent? More common now. Um, <laughs> We were one of the at the time. Give me a number: thirty percent, fifty, eighty. Oh no, no. Uh, when I retired, it was probably less than five percent for couples. Oh really? So what does the woman believe is the job of the special agent who's actually undercover agent? Does she not? Oh, know? she would know. She the would know. Spouses would have to know. But um, in in our case, we got to pose as boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband and wife. We got to check in the same motel room together. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. So how often would she work your case or be completely separate cases? Well, sometimes, uh, oh, totally separate cases, but um, sometimes on uh, larger surveillances where we are eating up, let's say, 30 or 40 people on a shift and you're doing three shifts a day that she might be on the same case, could be for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. Tell us a scary moment when uh, some of the criminals suspected that you were an undercover agent. Did they pull a gun on you to get in your face? Tell us a scary moment. Yeah, I've been threatened. Um, we had uh, researchers in Panama City looking for me in one of my undercover names. They hired uh, detective agencies and uh, think tanks, something like RAND, you know, uh, looking for me. But um, my background was pretty well backstopped. So wait, wait, they could actually hire the legit. I mean, I know Rand. I knew, knew buddies who, who were uh, employees at Rand, analysts, I should say. Uh, well, it's not, I, we didn't use, or they wouldn't use Rand that I know of, but think tanks like that. I, I, will, I will tell you a story. They use legitimate search technology and services to try to find, if they're criminals, to try to find an, a, a U.S. undercover agent. 
but you guys had such good background um, camouflaging that they couldn't discover that you were an undercover agent by using uh, traditional analytic means. Right. Investigations. Okay. They guess who's not on social media. Yeah, right. Exactly. So you, do you remember ever feeling super scared, not scared? What's that like? I have to say, not really. I, I have a lot of self-confidence. I, I was very good at what I did. And what did I do? I was a professional liar. That's the job. That's the job. It's, it's to be an actor, be a different persona, and you have to be the real deal. There's no fake. You know enough to be competent, and um, they can't discover you don't really know about boats. You have to basically know enough to look like you really are the boat captain they hired to be the smuggling colleague. That's it. And, and what about bite off more than you can chew? What yeah. about what about fights? Did you ever have to fight to save yourself? Well, when I worked for uh, Alcoholic Beverage Control, I was in uh, numerous bar fights, and I I always led with my face and. Uh, <laughs> broken nose this way that not really as a federal agent you know you're you know, you're well trained you uh, spend a lot of time in the gym uh working out you're you're tested physically every three months um with runs and things you're prepared for it but uh most things that we do we did with overwhelming manpower overwhelming force on your side. Could you tell an agent if you're if you're going to a bar and you're on another mission and you see somebody, is there enough you know about the service being a part of it that you could tell that person was an agent? He wasn't just a typical customer there? Yeah. Uh, and that used to happen in San Francisco between uh, the FBI working undercover cases, DEA working undercover cases, and customs working undercover cases. We had an occasion in Three surveillance teams showed up to the same upscale bar in Daly City. And I'm going, hey, there's Fred, there's John, there's Mary. Oh my God, we got we need to get out of here. <laughs> you know, a bar filled with 60 undercover agents, you know, surveillance teams. <laughs> Why would that be because because they happen to be converging on dumb, a dumb coincidence, dumb luck. Wow. Okay. But you can tell there's enough about what you're, you know, like you and I know if, if, if I go onto a golf course and I pick up a club, my buddy Ray Lent immediately would know he's a good golfer. Frank Maxwell, would, Ron can't golf. He's, he's a hundred, you know, hundred stroke golfer. Likewise, somebody gets on a sailboat. You and I know within moments that they can or can't sell sail, but somebody walks into a store. Is there some look you can look at him and, and look at, wait a second. That guy moves like he is actually an undercover agent. He's talk to me about that. Or a bad guy. Or a bad guy. Yeah, you're looking. You're looking for bulges. You're looking for furtive moves. You know the. Uh huh. Okay. People looking weird and strange. When when you walk into a, a restaurant, you walk in, um, let's say, with your wife with confidence. You know who you are, what you're there. You know that you're. Um, you're not going to draw a gun or a, a edged weapon. Um, and uh, there's a way you react. And uh, same thing with criminals. And you're, you're trained to look for these things. They, they're, you're saying they just, they automatically move in a different way. And after years of doing that business, being in that trade, you can recognize a criminal guy pretty, pretty, pretty quickly. Huh? Yeah, we sure tried. Yeah. Yeah. Really? So Ron, um, Tell me, how many uh, U.S. Customs agents are there in America, do you think? None. It was uh, abolished. It's now ICE. And uh, they're on the southern border doing things they don't, they, they really didn't want to do. They're dealing with people instead of cargoes. Remember, we talked about that a long time ago. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they're dealing with uh, the problem on the southern border. Um, last five years of my career, <clears throat> I worked at Joint Interagency Task Force West in Alameda, which is a um, counter narcotic fusion center um, funded by the Navy, but headed by a two star Coast Guard Admiral. And I was the Admiral's <clears throat> um, expert on smuggling and um, in, a, in an expert on border issues. And uh, 
if if you don't have a walled border, you don't have a country. And what's happened in the last eight weeks is absolutely criminal. And we are in a world of hurt. Um, they've because, taken, because genuine criminals are coming or because the eight-year-old kids have some other danger to them? What's What's the danger there? I used to give a classified lecture on crossing the border, the Mexican border. The commodity is not important, it's the route. Let's say 100 kilos is your, whatever you're smuggling. Okay. It's 220 pounds. Okay. It's, you, I'm Mexican, you smuggle me across the border for a fee. What about a suitcase nuclear weapon? What about 100 kilos of cocaine? What about simply a route where you're getting sick people coming across the border? You name the commodity, it's the smuggling route that's important. The, they've taken the border patrol people off the border to go to these processing stations to process all these people who've come across the border now, and the border's wide open. So you're saying what used to be customs agents now works for ICE. Remind us the acronym. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Okay. And what it, let's say you're a terrorist from an Arab country. Yeah. And you want to come to the United States. Sure. You don't need to bring weapons here. You don't need to bring explosives here. This is where it's all manufactured, right here at home. But you do need to get into the country. Why not fly to Costa Rica and get on a bus and come up to Mexico and come across the southern border, especially now. No one's checking you. So just come across in, in, in this herd of eight-year-olds and 10-year-olds fleeing Honduras and Guatemala. You're just part, you're one more fish crossing the border, you're saying. So you're a bad guy. It's, it's already been reported the last couple of weeks. Okay. So if, if you feel safer after January 20th, God bless you, <clears throat> I don't. So how many how many people are in ICE? Is this a hundred thousand employees? Ten thousand employees? Well, it comes under Homeland Security, and they're over two hundred thousand total. But ICE is probably eight thousand or something. Eight thousand agent types. Okay, gotcha. Agents, and then there's Border Patrol and Customs and Border Protection, and on and on and, and on. And when it comes to stationing agents, you were in California. Is it the Mexican border, or is it Panama? I mean, uh, Florida. Where where are the most interdictions? interdictions happening when you catch smugglers coming in where are the where are the big routes there's the balloon theory of smuggling you take a balloon you squeeze it in your hand a bulge comes out you squeeze it again a bulge comes out someplace else so if you squeeze the balloon and the bulge is san diego and all of a sudden san diego is overwhelmed with smuggling boats or or whatever and you bring a lot of agents in to counteract that the bulge is going to go someplace else. Miami, Cross Tampa, um, Houston. It just goes on and on. It's a it's an endless cycle. Okay, and, and well, I mean, it just, but it doesn't go up to like New Hampshire. <laughs> it's not Vermont. Yeah. No. Right. So, yeah. so where it's going to be is it's going to be the Mexican border. It's going to be on the edges of of Florida, not Mississippi, places like that. Why not bypass uh, San Diego and come to San Francisco Bay? Uh huh. How about bringing your smuggling loaded boat in on um, Monday of Memorial Weekend? Where it's real busy on the bay. Yeah. And there's a lot of traffic coming in. People right. have gone up to Drake's Bay and Half Moon Bay and Santa Cruz. Right. Well, so Ron, thank you very much for giving us kind of like insights into the life and times of a customs agent working undercover for uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency. The drug Enforcement works for the Justice Department. So does the FBI. We work for the Treasury Agency, okay. U.S. Customs Special Agents. And now all those customs agents have been incorporated into and, and wrapped up, rolled into ICE. They're now in, okay, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Enforcement. Well, thank you very much for sharing those with us. The next time you come to the grill room, uh, it'll be fun to uh, share a beer at RYC. Um, thanks very much for sharing your story with the Wednesday Outing Luncheon, mate. You are welcome. And all you need to give me, Ron, is your membership number. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>
Thanks, Rod. Much fun. Much fun. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. 